starting in verse 1. <clears throat> now the Lord said to Sam, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to, to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peacefully? And he said, Peacefully, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And so it was that when they came, he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. <clears throat> but the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For the Lord looks, for the man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So it was, and so Jesse called Abinadad and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made Shuma pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? And then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. He was ready and bright-eyed, good-looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And in the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that time forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. You know, the story here, if you're very familiar with, the anointing of, of uh, David as the new king of Israel. And there were several things that I noted I want to make mention of this morning that I noticed in these scriptures. You know, the, the first thing that I, I noticed here was Samuel it, it undoubtedly is mourning uh, the fact that Saul is no longer. We know the story. Saul had uh, done some things that were displeasing to God. He had uh, undoubtedly he was a man of God. He was the, the man that God chose when Israel came and said, hey, we want to be like everybody else. We want a king. And so God chose Samuel or Saul to be the first king. But like many people, when uh, uh, Saul became king, I guess the kind of power and the authority kind of went to his head, and he began to do things that was not allowed for him to do. He, he, he didn't listen to God and he went out on his own in several things. So God has removed Saul. He's not physically removed him yet, but he's actually taken the anointing from Saul as king and has placed it now on David. But Saul, Samuel is mourning the fact that Saul is no longer the king. Now, I don't think it was that uh, Samuel was so much in, in, in problem with, with uh, Saul as the king because he understood. As a matter of fact, when one of the times when, when Saul offered the sacrifice, when he came, he said, what have you done? You know, you're not supposed to be doing that. He rebuked the king. Uh, it wasn't the fact, it, I think it was the fact that what he was mourning was the fact that here the man that God had chosen to be in authority, to be the king, to be over Israel, to lead Israel in a godly path, this man had failed God. And he had failed to do 
what God had instructed him to do. I think this was more of what Saul was more or Samuel was mourning. But God comes now and says, How long are you going to mourn? I, I rejected him as king. You know, I think in life sometimes we all face hardships, we face tragedies, we, we face different problems and things in life. Uh, and, and sometimes we spend too much time dwelling on the problems, dwelling on the hardships, dwelling on what we have lost or what we have felt like we've given up or the problem that we've gone through. It doesn't matter what it, you know, it's the, uh, the death of, of someone, a family member, someone close to us. You know, we can, there, there is a time of mourning, the Bible says. There is a time for all things. But all things come to an end as well. And, and so, God speaks to Samuel and, and He says, how long are you going to mourn? You know, a lot of times we get in a rut. We, we, we get into a habit of doing something and we get stuck there. We have trouble moving on in life. And what we need to realize is just like God instructed Samuel here, there comes a time in life that we've got to move on from the past. If you remember uh, Paul in the book of Philippians, he talked about the things that he was striving for. And he said, the first thing I do is I forget those things which are behind me. We've got to come to a place and time in life that we forget the things behind us and we begin to move forward. God is never changing, but He's always moving forward and He expects us to move forward with Him. The children of Israel may have wandered through the wilderness for 40 years, but they never stopped for 40 years. They kept moving. And that's what we have to learn in life is that we have to keep moving in life. There's not a one of us here that can say, and that's from the pulpit to the Father's back pew, there's not a one of us here this morning who can say, I'm perfect, I've obtained, I've achieved, I'm exactly the highest point I can get. I'm as close to God as it's humanly possible to get. There's not a one of us who can say that. So we need to keep moving forward to try to reach that point in life. So, God asked him, how long are you going to mourn him? I reject him as king. Move on. So then he instructs him to fill his horn and go down to Jesse's house. He said, I have provided myself. Notice God says, I have provided. It's the second thing we need to learn. God provides. We just need to learn to follow. We need to, to fall in line with God's plan for our life, and what it is that we're doing because God has laid out a plan for every one of us this morning. He has a purpose for each one of us here today and He expects us to fulfill that purpose in life. Just like He expected Samuel to stop mourning, to move on, and go down to Jesse's house. But, you know, we can look back through uh, uh, most of the stories in the Bible and there was very few that didn't have an excuse uh, 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 something to hinder them from doing Samuel's thing was how can I go if I go down to Jesse's house to anoint the next king of Israel Saul steal the king he'll kill me now God's uh told him to go down and anoint the next king he provided a king so you think you know okay did God want Samuel to lie about it? and the question the answer to that is absolutely not because God will never lead us into a lie he'll never lead us into anything that would be contrary to his word he'll never lead us in sin so he simply tells Samuel what you're going to do is you're going to take a heifer with you you're going down and you're going to offer a sacrifice and tell Jesse, invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And so that's what he does. Now, God always makes a way. He always provides. You know, he goes down to uh, Jesse's house and he anoints David to be the king. But you know, it was several years later down the road before David actually became king. 
There were things that had to transpire. There were things that had to take place before David would actually rule on the throne. Another thing we need to remember in life, God's timing is always perfect. You know, uh, Mary, I think it was Mary, Mary and Martha, one, you know, said when Jesus came to Lazarus, when Lazarus had died, you wait. You let Jesus. If you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus wasn't late. He was right on time. Amen. And God's timing is always right on time. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Mount up with wings of eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. Because God's timing is always perfect if we learn to wait on Him. Then, <clears throat> Samuel gets them, and the prophets come. You know, you'd think Samuel, being the priest, being a godly man, you would think when the, when the priest came to town, the people would be excited to see him come. But the Bible said the prophets here in Bethlehem, that they kind of began to tremble. What's the prophet doing down here? They were worried. They were concerned. And, and so they asked the question, do you come in peace? Do you come peacefully? And of course, Samuel told him he did. He came down to offer a sacrifice. He said, why don't you get ready and come to the sacrifice with me? The sanctified or consecrated Jesse and his sons <clears throat> invited him to the feast. So they all go down together to offer this sacrifice to God, this heifer that He's brought. And I'm sure they went through everything, all the rituals, all the, the rules, <clears throat> the Old Testament of offering the sacrifices. They offered the sacrifice and they shared in the meal. <clears throat> and then it came time for Samuel to anoint the next king of Israel. Samuel looks at Jesse's oldest son. And he sees a, a man who, <clears throat> in his mind, he can just picture as being a great king. Probably a, a very uh, good sized young man, uh, strong. Everything about this man, Samuel saw in his eyes. He, he said, this surely is the anointed of God. You know, I thought of all the different things that have happened in the Bible. The very first sin, what happened? Eve looked out and she saw that the fruit was good for food. She looked with her eyes, with the natural eye, and saw that it was good. What the Bible says. And when she ate, sin and death and disease and destruction and every evil thing entered into the world because she saw that it was good. Sunday school lesson this morning was on Sodom and Gomorrah. Why did Lot end up dead in Sodom and Gomorrah? <clears throat> it was a, a quarrel between his herdsmen. And Abraham's herds. And so Abraham said, there's not going to be any quarrel between us. What we're going to do is we're just going to part company. You go one direction, I'll go the other, and I'm going to give you your choice. You choose whichever way you want to go, and I'll go the opposite way. Bible said, Lot lifted his eyes and looked down the Jordan plain and saw the green, lush grass, and it was well watered, and he probably thought in his mind, man, I'm going to get rich down there because my herds are going to prosper. They're going to do well. They're going to grow. They're going to multiply. I'm going to go that way. Abraham said, fine. You go down, I'll go up. I always wondered what happened to his herdsmen, what happened to his herds, what happened to everything Lot had because not just shortly after that, he ends up a city dweller. He's not out in the country. He's not out in the Jordan Plain watching over his flocks. 
It was down in the city of sin. Why? Because that direction looked good. Samuel looked at Eliab and said, Surely this is the next king of Israel because he looked like a king. If you take a, a, a grown man, a, a, a man, I, I don't know, maybe in his 30s, a, a, fairly, a man that's fairly strong, good looking, and you take a young boy that's 12 or 13 years old, that's, that's uh, ruddy looking, which means red, red faced, which one do you think is going to be a king? You wouldn't pick a 12 or 13 year old kid. Whatever it is that looks good, it's not always good. The Bible tells us that as God's children, we are to walk by faith, not by sight. Because we can look at story after story after story in the Bible of where people walk by sight and got themselves and us in trouble. We have to learn to see things as God sees them by looking through faith. Um, we have to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. Um, I, I, just a moment, I want you to look at a few pictures and then I'll make a point of this in a minute. Uh, just uh, kind of study each one of these for a moment. I'm sure as each one of those pictures came up immediately some kind of opinion of that person formed in your mind. Now you may not have consciously said that you know but you look at a person standing in a chart where most likely was a police photo. You make some kind of opinion, you make some kind of judgment on those. But remember when <clears throat> Samuel goes down to anoint this king. And he looked at each one of these sons of that, and the first two or three, maybe every one of them, when they passed by Samuel, he looked at them, and, and what he saw in his eyes was, this is a man that could be a king. But each time, God said, that's not the one. And so finally, when he went through every one of the sons, Samuel's thinking, hey God, you told me I was going to come down here and pick a son uh, of, of Jesse's, and he's prayed to every one of the boys before him. And so finally, Samuel says, Jesse, do you have any other sons? And, and Jesse says, well, I've got one, but he's just a kid. He's out watching over the sheep. What we have to realize is that God sees with the heart. God doesn't look with the, on the physical as we do. We have to be very careful about passing judgment and making decisions based on what we see with our eyes. God, sometimes we, we see the beginning of the picture. God sees the outcome. God sees the final result. And we have to be very careful about this, about making these choices. Samuel, each one of the sons passed by, but none of them were 
Jesus. He said, the Lord has not chosen these. So finally, he has to make another decision. He comes and he, he, he finds the youngest one and he tells him, he said, send him and we'll not sit down until he comes here. And so finally, they, they sit and they bring him in and it said he was ready with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him. This is the one. The one that seemed most unlikely to Samuel was the one that God chose. Sometimes in life, the path that seems most unlikely to travel will be the path that God puts us on. The choice that we would never make in a hundred years. That's the choice God wants us to make. It's important that we listen to the voice of God. The Bible said, Then Samuel took the horn and anointed them in the midst of the brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. And Samuel arose and went to Ramoth, for the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. The Spirit came, it came upon David because David was the newly anointed king. An evil spirit came upon Saul and it troubled him. You know, we need to understand, as Isaiah said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, said the Lord. For the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. We need to understand that it's uh, the most important thing that we'll ever do in life is what thus saith the Lord. God told Samuel to go down and anoint a king. Samuel went down and he anointed the king, not who he thought should have been king, <clears throat> but he anointed the son that God chose. This is the one. Rise up and anoint him. You know, God's ways are, are not always our ways, as Isaiah said. If you remember the story in John chapter 13. <clears throat> it was right before the feast of the Passover. Jesus girded himself up with a towel and a wash basin. And he began to wash the disciples' feet. Now, you'd think <clears throat> that the master would sit down and one of the servants would cut him <clears throat> and wash his feet. But here in this story, Jesus, as the Master, washes all the disciples' feet. Just the opposite of what we would think would transpire in life. Just, again, another example of showing us how God's ways are completely different from our ways in life. And we have to learn to accept God's ways. Accept the, 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 that which is different except that which is unusual follow him Matthew uh, chapter 24 verse 45 says who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give him food in due season verse 46 says blessed is that servant whom his master when he comes will find him so doing. <clears throat> you know, we need to understand that as we started off, <clears throat> the we have to learn to move on from the past. <clears throat> Listen to God's voice and to follow Him. We have to learn to do what God instructs us to do, no matter how odd, how unusual, how strange it may be. When God instructs us, we follow His instructions. Blessed is that person, that servant, whom is master, when He comes, find Him so doing. <clears throat> will God, <clears throat> will God find you and me doing what He has instructed us to do when He returns. Will we be doing His will? Amen. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank You this morning for the privilege and honor to come and share Your Word. And Father, we pray this morning that as You look down upon Your children, 
Father, you'll speak to our hearts and we'll hear your voice. And Father, we pray that we will each be that blessed servant whom when you do return, you'll find us doing what you've instructed us to do. Father, we pray that your perfect will will be accomplished through our lives and that our lives will bring glory and honor to you. Father, we pray this morning that that we're each, Father, striving to live close to you, as close to you as we can. But if there's one here this morning, Father, that is not where we should be, Father, we pray that you'll speak to our heart. Help us to make the changes to draw closer to you. Father, that one that may be here that's backslidden, Father, we pray that you'll draw them closer to you this morning. And Father, if there's one here this morning that's lost a little bit without Christ, one that's never repented of their sins and received Christ as Lord and Savior, we pray this morning will be the day of their salvation. Speak to each heart. Help us to hear your voice. We pray, pray Father, that we'll each be obedient to the leadership of the Holy Spirit this morning. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And I ask you to stand with me this morning. As always, if you, as you have a need in your life, uh, we pray that you allow God to meet that need this morning.